Good evening. Good evening and welcome. If you could, please go ahead and make your way to a seat if you haven't already. Welcome. My name is Andrew Westover, and I'm the Eleanor, Donald, Eleanor McDonald Storza Deputy Director for Learning and Civic Engagement here at the High Museum of Art. <laughs> Thank you. I am especially honored to welcome you all tonight for our Margaret and Terry Stent Distinguished Conversation in American Art, Edgefield Pottery. You may have noticed the yellow letters projected on the screen behind me. This is a live captioning service. A person in another room is listening to the sound the microphones pick up, then transcribing that sound into text. Should the captioner incorrectly type a word or phrase during this program, I encourage you to lend them some grace, and I hope you find the service useful. A special thank you to High Museum members in attendance. Your support is invaluable and fuels our mission. If you are not yet a member of our museum or need to renew, please visit high.org at the end of this program. Tonight's program is in conjunction with our current exhibition, Hear Me Now, The Black Potters of Old Edgefield, South Carolina, which was organized by the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston with support from the Terra Foundation for American Art and the Henry Luce Foundation. This exhibition is currently on view, and if you haven't yet seen it, you must. It will close on May the 12th, so you still have a bit of time. I encourage you to come back often. This exhibition was made possible by funding from our exhibition series donors, Delta Airlines Incorporated, ACT Foundation Incorporated, William N. Banks, Jr., Joseph H. Bolin, Jr., the Cousins Foundation, Burton M. Gold, Sarah and Jim Kennedy, Harry Norman Realtors, the Wish Foundation, and Benefactor Exhibition Series supporters Robin and Hilton Howell. Also, thank you to the full high team for their essential support that makes this program happen. Tonight, we will hear from the high's own Monica Obnitsky and Katie Gentleson, and we are especially glad to welcome curator Jason R. Young to this conversation as well. I'll now invite Monica to share more about tonight's program. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Monica Bnisky. I am the High's Curator of Decorative Arts and Design. I'd like to add to Andrew's welcome. Thank you all for being here this evening. Our lecturer this evening is the esteemed Jason R. Young, uh, one of the three co-curators of Hear Me Now, The Black Potters of Old Edgefield, South Carolina. And just to say that the other curators are in attendance this evening, and so we are so thrilled um, to have everyone, to have the band back together, as it were. Um, and as Andrew just said, as you all know, the exhibition is on view here at the High, the fourth and final venue for this extraordinary exhibition. Young is an associate professor of history at the University of Michigan and teaches and researches 19th century US history, African American history, and the African diaspora, and specializes in the history of art, religion, and folk culture. His writing has been published in the Journal of African American History, Journal of Africana Religions, and Journal of Southern Religion, among others. He is also author of Rituals of Resistance, African American, excuse me, African Atlantic Religion in Congo and the Low Country South in the Era of Slavery. And just as a plug, you can purchase a signed copy of this important text uh, that Jason signed for us earlier today. Uh, after this lecture in the um, lobby, uh, our wonderful colleague Nicole is selling copies of Jason's book as well as the exhibition catalog, Hear Me Now. Jason is also a co-editor with Edward J. Blum of The Souls of W.E.B. Du Bois, New Essays and Reflections. Now, it is extra special that we are welcoming Jason to the stage, not only because his PhD in history is from the University of California, Riverside, but mainly because he's also a Morehouse man. Um, and he, yes. I know there are some alums and, and current Morehouse um, men in the crowd. Uh, he graduated from Morehouse with a degree in history and French. Um, so uh, we, are, we are thrilled to be welcoming him. 
So after Jason's lecture, we, he is going to enthrall us all um, with a short lecture, and then afterward, he'll be joined on the stage by my colleague and venue co-curator, uh, Catherine Gentleson, who is the Marie and Dan Boone Curator of Folk and Self-Taught Art and Senior Curator of American Art at the High Museum of Art. Uh, since joining the High in 2015, she has curated nine exhibitions, including most recently George Varnofsky, Memoryscapes, and Really Free, The Radical Art of Nellie Mae Rowe. Jenelson has grown the High's renowned collection of folk and self-taught art by more than 500 works, including major acquisitions of work by Varnofsky, Thornton Dial, Lonnie Holly, the G's Bend Quilters, and Henry Church. Uh, recently, in 2020, 22, she began a three-year term as co-executive editor of Panorama. Um, Jenelson holds a BA from Cornell University and a PhD in her history from Duke University. And now, Atlanta, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jason Young to the stage for the Stent Lecture in American Art. Good evening. I'll let the first one pass so we can try it again. <laughs> Good evening. I've been asked to speak for 20 or 25 minutes and like a good Baptist preacher, I promise to be brief. <laughs> I would like first to acknowledge, and more than that, celebrate the wonderful achievement of this truly astonishing installation of Hear Me Now. I am awed by this, the fourth iteration of this exhibition. It is a celebration and a song to the Black Potters of Old Edgefield, South Carolina. I want to acknowledge my co-curatorial partners, Adrian Spinozzi and Ethan Lasser, with whom I've been traveling on this journey for years. The show first opened in the fall of, of 2022, but our conversations began much earlier than that. Several members of Dave's family are here, as they have been at each and every step along the way, and I feel just so honored to say that I know them. Especially in this moment of triumph and celebration, I feel obliged almost to whisper in the most furtive, hushed tones some of the sufferings that this show produces in me. I've carried these feelings like a weight in galleries. I've carried it behind lecterns. I've carried it in classrooms. I've written and revised and deleted these aches on computer keyboards and on PowerPoint presentations. And tonight, I want to bring some of this pain out to play, to let it see you and you it. Let's see what happens. To begin, I'm reminded of the Jamaican writer, uh, Dennis Scott, whose brief poem, Construction, helps to clarify the curious lives of black people living in this, the moment of our current discontent. He writes, sometime in the great house wall is like a thumb marked the stone or a whole hand. Granny say is the work sign. She say it favor when a man tackle the stone and make to tear it down to the mortar take the same shape as him hand. But I feel say is like somebody push the wall up and hold it there until the brick them dry out. And that is hard. This then is the legacy of enslaved Africans captured and carried through the Middle Passage 
onto American shores. In one sense, they and their progeny were crucial to the formation of the modern world, working the land on, sla on slave plantations, laboring under it in mines, and traversing the nether spaces between as sailors and soldiers, black people were essential to the development of emerging forms of modernity. They pushed up the walls of the modern world and hold it there until the brick them dry. Though they were central to the creation of modernity, black people have also provided perhaps the clearest and most consistent challenges to its ugliest legacies of its forced labor, racial oppression, and colonial domination. Here, black people have worked both under slavery's yoke and in its aftermath to tackle the stone and make to tear it down. These efforts have borne fruit in slave rebellions and conspiracies, in state houses and landmark court cases, revealing a slow simmering culture of resistance found in and fed by black art of its music and dance and poetry and divination. If this is just a roundabout way of saying that black people bear a rare strange relationship with the West, then so be it. We are both firmly rooted on its soils even as we are relegated to its distant shores. We gaze upon the West as through a watery lens, just as we are viewed through that self-same partition. From that liminal perch, black people cast dark shadows and haunt the West in its comfortable slumber. We drift upon her shores as so many refugees, captive Africans, temporary migrant workers, and immigrants. We live in the faraway nether spaces or in the centers of grand cities, in American inner cities, in Brazilian, Brazilian favelas, and in French banlieue. And from here, on this perilous perch, we set fires and mix healing powers, powders, and harmful poisons. And from here is our Santeria, our candomblé, and from here is our juju and our jump shot. Here we stir the cook pot full for Hoppin John and jollof rice and gumbo, for kelewele and wache and for grits, or as Dave put it in 1858, fill this jar with pork or beef. Scott will be there to get a piece. I see a hand extending reaching, grasping stubbornly from the past up to and through to the present, a signature in the form of a handprint and the bottom of a pot as a clay tablet. This hand is a testifying, a telling of truths. You may see the bottom of a broken pot. I'm looking at a time travel machine. I imagine in this hand a furtive attempt to break free of all constraints whether temporal or physical, a hope for a place not here, for a time not now. I see in this hand a crossing of time and geographies are reaching out to us. And though we might protest the improbability of such a technology and declare this witnessing a mere fic fiction, I'm reminded of Toni Morrison's faith in untellable tales. Stranger things happen all the time, everywhere. She writes, you know, I know you know. One question is, who is responsible? Another one is, can you read? To be sure, the persistence of this handprint can be easily explained, explained away as a mere chemical reaction, a coincidence. But the clasping of our hands to this one is a necessary impossibility. The objects on view and hear me now are, to be sure, things of the past, but they also provide for us a lens to better understand the vexations of black life in the here and now. Our bodies and forever lost souls are now so quickly absorbed, consumed really, before being returned to us as a number of slogans. Hands up, don't shoot. I can't breathe say her name. But we are big and broad 
and wide, and our losses cannot be accounted in hashtags. This hole in the heart of us, in all of us, is a vast emptiness, an echo chamber shouting to us our strivings, humming to us our hymns, like a long forgotten lullaby. This is the true nature of our connection to the past. It is always already incomplete and broken. Sharp, dangerous shards where the stained glass windows used to be. Saidiya Hartman calls these shards traces of memory that function in a manner akin to a phantom limb in that what is felt is no longer there. Or I'm reminded of Octavia Butler's kindred and the cruel cost that the past levied on the body of Dana, a young black woman pulled repeatedly and against her will from the comfort of her life in the present to the plantation of her ancestral past. I lost an arm on my last trip home, my left arm. And so this reaching, grasping hand is our necessary impossibility, our improbable bridge from this known place to the foreign shores of the past. Writing in another context, I recalled my own walks through the valley of dry bones that comprise these vast ceramic grave sites. Walking in and around Edgefield, I found myself trying to step ever so slightly, ever so lightly through the remains of cracked mouths, shoulders, and handles. I felt myself traversing a wasteland, a vast open grave littered with ceramic bones. Just there, the fat, round belly of a jug juts out from underneath. A tiny shirt is all but imperceptible, save for the glimmer of its gaze, glaze. Occasionally, I spy a kiln brick, evidence of yet another layer of history sedimented deeper, further down beneath its surface. I'm frustrated that despite my best efforts, I am utterly failing to maintain the solemn silence that I deem appropriate when in the presence of the dead. With every step, bits and pieces of old shirts crack, crumbling underfoot. Edgefield pottery strikes me as both alluring and elusive. These objects draw me in even as they push me away. I find myself ever straining to hear what stories they have to tell me, squinting to catch a glint of their hidden meanings. In putting these objects up for view, the genius of enslaved people takes center stage. As a body, the pottery traditions of old Edgefield demand a remarkable degree of strength and physical dexterity, but coupled with the finest attention to deft detail, the material is at turns utilitarian and spiritual, it is visually stunning and poetically captivating, but it is also fugitive by nature. This fugitivity can be marked in a wall of names that is both a celebration of black potters, even as it stands as a cruel indictment of an historical record that failed to capture black people in all of the wholeness, all of their wholeness in the first place. For some of the people on this list, we know the first name, but not the last. For others, we know the year that they died, but not the year of their birth. We know something about the work that some of them did. This information was simply not recorded for many others. In an attempt to respond to this imperfect, incomplete archive, the curatorial team developed, and our partners here at The High have wonderfully embraced and revised a convention marked by a line and with the reference, makers once known. We intend this blank line to serve as an invitation, hoping that with increased attention and research, we might be able to name some of the previously unnamed. But failing that, the line will remain a gesture, a holding of space for people who lived, loved, and who were loved by others. I just want to say for a moment, um, 
uh, to congratulate for a moment the educational and outreach team at the high in their presentation of incredible um, uh, educational tools that are, that are available on the website for um, this show. It's really quite fascinating, and I just want to say out loud that the team did a great job of, of developing um, teacher training. Yes, please, yes. They did an incredible job of creating uh, material that's available and accessible and um, relevant for students at, at various ages so that you can enter in from the place where you are. I just, I don't want to say anything else before I say that first. The fragile fugitivity of this material is marked in the broken, cracked, and reconstructed pieces that are included in Hear Me Now. Part of the power of these, people, of, of these pieces is rooted in the language that we use to describe pottery. Uh, that is, in our efforts to humanize the clay body, we refer to the mouth of the pot, to the lips, to its shoulders and its feet. In this lexical practice, the pot becomes a metaphorical person. And much like the clay body, so too is the human body, fleeting and frail. So too is it resilient, hardened by the fiery trials of life. So too can it be broken, cracked, and punctured. And like people, this material protects itself, not only from the elements and the passage of time, but also from our own prying eyes, answering some of our questions, but holding fast to some of its deeper mysteries. And now this part. I would like to tell you a story now, but I don't know how. It's an impossible story, and it happened to me. It happened to me in this building not too long ago. I hesitate to tell the story not because I fear that you wouldn't believe me. It is an unbelievable story and it would be perfectly reasonable for you to be doubtful. Instead, I hesitate to tell you this story because if I tell you, and if you believe me, then you will be obliged to carry some of the weight of it with you. Better than for you to have your own gravity and for me to have mine. I, I don't mean to be cryptic here. So, so until, instead of telling you this story, I'll tell you two others. Uh, story number one. In 1858, a racing yacht called The Wanderer landed on Jekyll Island with a cargo of roughly 400 illegally imported Africans, some 50 years after the transatlantic slave trade had, ma had been made illegal. About half that number was disembarked quickly and shuttled up the Savannah River to the Lamar Plantation in Aiken, South Carolina. Historical records confirm that some of the wander survivors were subsequently put to work in the region's expansive ceramic industry. Notably, some of the buildings that originally housed slaves, the, the so-called slave quarters, are still standing on this property. Years later, in 1908, a group of anthropologists descended on the area to find some of the survivors, some of the wanderer survivors still living in the area. We have that team of researchers to thank for these photos. The arrival of the wanderer survivors coincided with an explosion of a very particular artistic form that married their African heritage with the means and materials of the ceramic tradition to which they had been brought against their will. You've seen some of these objects if you were um, able to, to walk through the gallery in the form of face vessels. Much of the material that enslaved people created in and around Edgefield, much of the ceramic material was made for the use 
and benefit and proper operation of the slave plantation. These items, by every account, were not. They were made in the time before the day started. They were made in the, day, in, the, in the hours after the day ended. When we want to know something about how African people expressed their, themselves artistically and, and aesthetically, we have the face vessel tradition to look to. One of the reasons why the face vessels are relatively smaller than some of the other massive vessels that you see on view in the show is that these materials would have been placed in the gaps and spaces and crevices and cracks in the kiln between those big um, vessels. I'll have more to say about face vessels in just a few moments. But I want to tell you story number two. Uh, writing in her classic novel, uh, Beloved, Toni Morrison describes a house uh, called 124 that held its own history within its rafters. Uh, this is Toni Morrison. You know, some things you forget, other things you never do, but it's not. Uh, places, places are still there. If a house burns down, it's gone, but the place, the picture of it stays, and not just in my rememory, but out there in the world. I mean, even if I don't think it, even if I die, the picture of what I did or knew or saw is still out there. Someday you'll be walking down the road and you hear something or you see something so clear and you think it's you thinking it up, a thought picture. But no, it's when you bump into a rememory that belongs to somebody else. The slave cabin on the Lamar plantation and the so-called big house that stands a stone's throw away are still telling stories right now. And you scarcely need to strain your ears to hear them. In this vast valley of dry ceramic bones, every shard is a storyteller, every inscription an invitation, every pot is a world in itself. Stranger things happen all the time, everywhere. You know. I know you know. One question is who is responsible. Another is can you read? Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, I think it's, a, it's remarkable to hear you speak tonight, because we all know it's a kind of important moment for the show at the end of its tour. Um, so it feels like a really, a very full moment. Um, I feel full. <laughs> you feel full. <laughs> well, thank you for filling us and sharing so many um, so many beautiful words with us tonight and so much about the depth of your experience being involved in this show. Um, I think that I wanted to start with um, diving back into face vessels because I feel that it's a part of this Edgefield tradition that um, is both newly opened up, especially by the research that you've shared in the catalog and some of what you've shared with us tonight and at the same time is still so mysterious and leaves so many questions. And so I wanted to kind of talk specifically about some of the objects that are in the show, uh, the Inkisi that comes from the museum collection where you work, and also this really remarkable vessel that's in the Metz collection, which was, uh, has an incredible provenance of having been owned by a really interesting spiritual healer named Mamie DuVoe, who was based in Savannah. And I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about uh, the kinds of connections that, that you made in the catalog um, and have made throughout your research 
between face vessels like this and the spiritual practices of Congo. Yeah, I, I appreciate that um, opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, so I have been interested for a very long time in the cultural relationships between West Africans and their progeny in the Americas. I've been asking myself questions about what happens to African languages when you um, take a group of people, take them out of their cultural context, drop them in a completely different context? What parts of language um, are preserved and what parts are not? What parts of religion? What parts of food ways? What parts of architectural design? What kinds of aesthetics remain and what changes? And also related to this, what is the nature of the community conversation? I think it's important to note that we, we may use the term Africans, but it's really a misnomer. You're talking about a group of people who were brought from vastly different cultures, vastly different language systems, vastly different um, belief systems, and they had to negotiate with themselves to create something that we now think of as black American culture. It is a remarkable feat that these vastly different people came together and created a people. And so the, the face vessel tradition is for me in line with this longer set of questions that I've been asking. What is the relationship between Africans and their progeny in the Americas? One of the things that we find is um, that there are really clear connections between the Nkisi tradition that you see on your, on your left and the emergence of, of the face vessel tradition in the Americas. I'll, I'll talk just a, a bit about some of the physical relationships um, and then just take a quick detour to talk a bit about some of the aesthetic um, relationships that exist. As, as some of you, you may know, kaolin, um, this uh, fine white substance that's incredibly significant in the, and important in the production of pottery, was a substance that was in, in, um, very much in abundance in West Central Africa. In West Central Africa, kaolin was used as a ritual substance. It was the material that helped to um, activate communications between this world and the next. So what does it mean to be a captive African, not only during the period of the legal transatlantic slave trade, but for the decades after um, the slave was made illegal? What does it mean to be a captive African brought from West Central Africa where you know already that kaolin is a powerful substance and find yourself enslaved in a region where kaolin is in vast abundance? So I don't think it's any um, mistake at all that you find kaolin being introduced into the face vessels as a way of activating those, um, those objects. And so in some ways, the, the object that you see on your left is a Congo and Kisi figure that is made contemporaneous to the emergence of the face vessel tradition in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. These are um, brother cousins um, when you look at them together. And, and one thing I learned from you a little bit more about today is um, it's not just that Kaylin would be inserted inside these vessels, right? It's the eyeballs and other yes. features, right? So that's, that's another right. thing that distinguishes them from other Edgefield stoneware. So do you yeah. want to talk about Yeah, I think that? you're absolutely right about that. Um, both in terms of the Nkisi tradition, the one that you see on the left, and the face vessel tradition here, the idea of containment is, in, is incredibly important. That is to say that these objects are meant to be containers for substances. Um, in the Nkisi, the, the body of that object was often um, the place where you would put spiritual medicines um, and where you would be kind of doing that kind of work. I think that this face vessel that we're looking at is incredibly interesting um, because you have to imagine that the Africans who are moving across this vast water space across this transatlantic space are not able to recreate precisely the cultures that they came from. And so sometimes you see metaphors or you see concepts or you see linguistic turns of phrase that are meant to establish the connection to this African traditional past. Let me explain a bit um, what I mean. On the left, you see that that Nkisi is um, studded with these sharp blades. In some ways, the Nkisi object can be read as a contract. These objects are used and operated by ritual experts. 
and you go to those ritual experts to have any number of, uh, any, any number of kind of uh, work done on your behalf, medical work, medicinal work, um, divination work, and when the person who's coming to the ritual expert, to the nganga, um, asks for a certain work to be done, it is necessary to activate the nkisi in order to do that work. And so nails or blades or sharp edges are put into the body of the nkisi in order to activate it, to make it work. Hollywood, in the absolute worst way, picked up on this ritual tradition in the form of voodoo dolls, which are entirely a figment of Hollywood's imagination. More to the point, these objects are contractual, and the, in, the, um, the activation of that contract works at this moment of striking. It is, to my mind, incredibly interesting that the face vessel that you see um, to the right has inside of it um, a bit of a matchbox. And if you look very closely, the matchbox includes a kind of warning that says, close before striking, keep out of reach of children. I read in that connection a kind of verbal attempt to strike that, that Nkisi vessel to work. You're not striking it with nails, you're not driving nails into the ceramic body of this face vessel, but you are, at least linguistically, um, calling up the, the importance and the necessity to strike it, to activate it to power. So again, I see these, these vessels as really closely connected. And, and because the histories of these, these kinds of objects and, and other African diasporic cultural practices that had to be kept secret or, or private or personal are um, fragmentary, right? Our knowledge of them now is from these kinds of traces that, that we're left with. Um, one of the ways that we believe face vessels to have had these kinds of um, uh, you know, functions is the way that they were left on grave sites, right? So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so you find face vessels um, and also in a, in a broader sense, glass, porcelain, and pottery of various sorts used as a part of funerary and burial tradition. And again, this is a practice that you find on both sides of the Atlantic. You find this in West Central Africa in the Congo region, and you find it especially in this region in particular, in Georgia, South Carolina region, where it is important once a person passes, once a person passes away, it is important to break the cycle of death so that um, so that, that death doesn't spread or, um, or affect other people in the community. The way that you break that cycle of death is to break ceramics, pottery, or glass, and then place it atop grave sites. So you see burial sites in, in the Congo region from roughly the same time would, that would be decorated with these broken uh, vessels, with kind of broken pottery. It's a part of funerary tradition. And you find the same thing happening in the southeastern United States where enslaved African Americans, and this tradition goes even after the period of slavery. It extends into the 19th and 20th century where you see ceramics, face vessels, and other materials being placed on um, burial sites and on burial grounds. So there's a clear connection between um, those two ritual practices. So this is a good moment to transition to talk about um, a contemporary piece in the show by an artist who's here, Adebumi Badevo, in our audience. Yay. And Bunmi's featured in some wonderful videos in the galleries too, so if you haven't had a chance to watch those, definitely um, watch them on our website or, or uh, in the galleries. But um, this is a piece that, that Bunmi made um, with a connection to an ancestral gravesite uh, of her family. And so I know we wanted to kind of take a moment to honor her work and speak a little bit about what it, what it brings to the show. I, I wanted to say a couple of things. Let me say something first before I say anything. In my family, um, before we open our mouths, we are asked a question. And that question is, is this your story to tell? <laughs> so if you start to tell a story in my family, you have to be clear that this is your story to tell. If it's not your story to tell, you're not meant to tell it. And so I want to be very clear, boom, like, this is not my story to tell. This is your story to tell. But I wanted to spend some time um, really with you here 
to indicate just how crucial uh, Bumi has been as an interlocutor, as a traveler, as um, a curator, as a speaker, and as a contributor to this um, show. Um, I met Bumi uh, on a computer screen a few years ago. And within the first minute or so of talking, we realized that we were both in that very moment mourning the one year anniversary of the loss of a parent. Um, I was mourning the loss of my father. Bumi was mourning at the same time. One of the reasons why I wanted to highlight this um, object, but also this practice, is to, is to make clear that as much as we are as historians or curators or interested people trying to piece together this fragmentary history from the past, that this work is actually in the very, and I mean this in the most literal sense, it is in the very DNA of this project, the continuing kinds of work that people like Bumi are doing in their arts practice, in their research practice, and this is not a thing of the past. We're not, um, we're not just digging up old bones. We're in the moment, in the practice, in the body of this work. Right now, it's happening. Mm -hmm. And that, that was kind of where we planned to, to end is just that one of the amazing things, um, you know, about, about getting to be a part of the show, the high, you know, so lucky to, to have become the fourth and final venue of it. But we've been a party to, you know, all of these amazing convenings and the events that other venues have held and getting to know Boonmi and other artists who are involved in the show, um, getting to know uh, Dave's family, who um, close to 30 members um, of your family are here tonight, which is, which is absolutely amazing. Um, And it's, it's one of the amazing kind of characters of the show and, and, and just goes to demonstrate how necessary it is that it has all of these different spokes that are kind of coming off the wheel and going in different directions. And one of them really has been the kind of union, reunion of Dave the Potter and Poet's family to his work and the, the ability for you know, us to celebrate together this incredible ancestor um, that you all have. And so we wanted to definitely take a moment to not only acknowledge um, you all being here and coming to Atlanta and being a part of this with us as you have been at, at all of the other venues as well, um, but also to uh, invite you to come, to come speak. And so um, Letitia, Miss Letitia Carolina Powell, if you um, would love to have you come up here and just kind of take the mic for a moment. Um, and say anything you'd like to on behalf of the family and just be careful because this mic is on the back. Thank you. Sure. Well, thank you for having us. We really um, appreciate all that you all have done, all of the museums, all of the curators, um, all of the staff um, with all of the exhibits. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, Dave's work is so important, it's immensely important, historically as well as culturally. So just um, you're taking the time to celebrate Dave and his work um, is really a great, um, it's a great honor. Um, I would like to read um, some remarks that my 16-year-old nephew wrote about Dave. My 16-year-old nephew wrote about Dave. I'd like to read his remarks right now. Um, he says, ladies and gentlemen, Today, I picture a man born into the harsh reality of slavery in the 19th century, a man whose very existence was bound by chains, but whose spirit soared above the oppression that surrounded him. Dave's story is a testament to the triumph of the human soul over the darkest of circumstances. Through his hands, he shaped clay into pottery, and through his heart, he etched verses onto those vessels. The, these inscriptions were not mere words. They were fragments of his soul, an outpouring of emotions that had no other escape. 
He transformed clay and fire into vessels of resistance, carrying his dreams and sorrows, his hopes and frustrations. As we look upon his pottery, we see more than just functional items. We see a silent cry for freedom, an echo of the pain of bondage, and a resounding call for justice. Jay, Dave was not just a potter, he was a poet of resistance. In the lines he inscribed, he wrote of love and longing, of the beauty he saw in the world, and of the injustice he experienced. Sometimes I imagine the courage it took Dave to etch his name onto those pots, a name that was meant to be forgotten, erased by those who sought to subjugate him. In that act, he asserted his identity, his existence, and his unbroken spirit. Even though the median age of death for a slave was 22, and most died with no headstone, he found a way to immortalize himself. Dave legacy, Dave's legacy reminds me that even when humanity is denied its most basic rights, it can find a way to sing, to dream, and to resist. As I celebrate Dave the Potter today, I won't just admire his art, but feel the intensity of his emotions. Let his story move us, let it inspire us, and let it remind us that art and creativity are not mere luxuries, but vital lifelines. It calls upon us to keep the flame of resistance burning, no matter the challenges we face. It has been a gift to be able to not have my ancestry be a question mark. His example left a challenge, a challenge to leave behind something meaningful of your own. Fortune, Allen Carolina IV. Well, it definitely seems like poetry runs through the family line to the present. That was unbelievable. You must be really very proud of your son. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and we wanted to use the remaining time for, for questions that you may have. So we're going to break out some microphones. Uh, if you want to raise your hand, one of our staff will come to you with a, with a microphone and and please speak into it, because we are recording this program. We're going to make it publicly available. So if you don't use the mic, we won't be able to hear you. So any questions from the audience or, or anything else that any, any family wants to share, we would, we would welcome. Well, I'm dying to hear what was the connection that you had in slave shit, the, the shack. Um, I mean, spiritually, certain things are anchored. Um, ancestry, um, things are bestowed to generations after generations, but they're told in a format that is not really verbal. Maybe it's more of a feeling or a spiritual awakening, but something that anchors you to the past that brings you to the future. Um, I think a lot of African Americans and people in different cultures, um, when they finally found out where their beginning begins, they can make a connection that is unexplained in a verbal sense, but it's more on a spiritual sense, since majority Africans and African Americans have a a strong spiritual sense in nature and just just curious because although those things may be kind of not completely explainable but you'd be surprised when you talk about it someone else has that same experience as well and it doesn't end in something that is false it kind of puts it on a different level. So is there a way that you can explain or just touch on the surface of that? Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
rather than an explanation, it might be better to call this a translation than an explanation. Uh, some time ago, I was, um, no, I wasn't alone, and as much as is possible, I would like to extricate myself from this story. It's just that it happened to me. Um, I, with a group of people, and we were visiting the, You said that this is recorded. <laughs> mm -mm. And so I'm going to be brutally honest with you. And I'll pay the price later if it happens. <clears throat> I was visiting the site with a mixed group of people. Uh, there were black people in the group and white people in the group. I am a sensitive soul. And I know that I have to care, take care of the inside of me. <laughs> and so I waited for others to um, walk in and around and to see the site. And, and I thought that everyone had left when I went in. Inside is a, a hearth kind of fireplace. I cannot explain this to you, but I will try to translate that a force, an energy, came up in me and it had direction. It was a force or an energy that started underneath the floor of that structure. It started under the floor of that structure. It came through the floor of that structure. It moved with direction up and out of me. And when that happened, it broke my body down. I all but collapsed. My dear friend, Ethan Lasser, <laughs> was still in the building. I thought he had left. And he walked around seeing me. And um, in, in a, a tremendous gesture of grace, I think, Ethan, he just let it be and left um, the space. Eventually, I came out. Ethan didn't say a word about it to me. <laughs> when I came out of the building, he didn't say a word about it until later that night when we were at dinner. And he said, I didn't know what to do, Jason. <laughs> I saw you, and I didn't know whether or not I should help. Um, I'll say also that on a second trip, we visited not just the slave quarters, but also the big house on that plantation. And though I didn't have the very same experience, it is also a building that is speaking right now. I had a question about the shards that you say were, you know, the jugs were crashed onto the graves. Are any of the jugs in the show reconstituted from shards that were on graves? Um, if not, where are those? Uh, are they still on graves? And you know, what does it mean if you do reconstitute those as a pot? I think I have two answers to that question, actually. One is that we, we can't know for sure like all of the places that these, this material has been. Uh, even, I think that's even true for the shards. We can't know for sure every place that they've been. But I'll, I'll say two things to, to your point. One is that ceramics were being produced in and around Edgefield at an industrial level. So much so that even now, this landscape is littered with the shards of this material. The evidence of this production is still just a part of the landscape. It's in the ground. And so there's still a kind of living history as you walk through the space that this material is just so prevalent. And it's because so much of it was produced over a long period of time and at such a scale that it's just in the ground. The other thing that I would say, and Bumi, this is kind of related to some of the work that you've been doing, is I think that we have to be really um, intentional and deliberate about the care that we take of slave and black funerary sites in this country. 
that many of these, and I'm speaking even of, of the history of, of the um, cemetery where many members of my own family are buried, many of these sites have been overrun and overgrown and discarded and, and, and tossed away. And I think there's a lot of work that we have to do to, to take care of these spaces and these sites. And they're everywhere underneath our feet. Relating to your experience at the site in Edgeville, have you had any recurring experiences since then? Um, of, of that particular um, type, no. Um, but I will say, and I'm not joking about this one. I, I really was not joking when I said um, the discretion that I, the discretion that I was displaying at the podium to not share this story because it will mean that some of you may carry this with you. I, you can take, you can, I only have this body and this experience in this life and I'm, I'm trying to be honest. If you, if you need to just discard this part, you can just toss it away. But I really was trying to show a certain amount of discretion. And so, but thank you for the invitation to talk about it at the same time. And I will say that there's a part of this that is in me that is not going away. Um, and I've, I feel it in an embodied way. Thank you for sharing that. All of you took so much time to create this over the last, I guess, four or five years. So what part of it exceeded your expectations? And what part of it surprised you? Yeah. I think the part, um, the part that, I, I won't say exceeded my expectations, but it's the part that I've embraced now. And, and the curatorial team has talked about this. We've, we're very much aware of this. You might imagine, <laughs> one, one might imagine that an exhibition has a start date and an end date. <laughs> and the show goes up and then it comes down. This show is not like that. <laughs> it is never coming down. Um, I joke that the conversations that led to this, to this exhibition started around a fairly small table. And at every point, that table has been getting larger and larger and larger with new experts and new ideas and new voices. And I don't see that ending with the official closing of the show in May. In fact, you know, I ate in your house, <laughs> you, you know, like this, these, some of these connections are, are forever. You got me, like, <laughs> you're stuck with me at this point. And so a part of this show is just, it's living on. So that does, that has exceeded my expectations. The part that surprised me is that by and large, all of the material that's in this show has been the same from venue to venue. 90%, 95% of the material has been the same as it's traveled. This show has been completely different in every single space. It was one thing in New York, which was fantastic. And then it had a whole different identity in, in Boston. And then it became something different in Michigan. And now there's like, it's another iteration. It's this really interesting thing that space and place and context, it changes the whole thing so much so that um, someone, I think it, I think Wayne may have said this, um, that even when you put the Dave pieces together in a different configuration, they have a different conversation with each other. Just because of like who they're sitting next to. Almost like kids in a, in a classroom, you know? The configuration and the conversations are gonna depend on who's sitting at that table. It's been that way with this show, like the conversations have been changing as we've moved the pieces around. Hi, I just want to thank the curators and hi, this is a really wonderful exhibition. It has a really intense emotive quality that I haven't ever really experienced um, here. So I just want to thank you. And my question is about provenance. I'm curious as to at what point were these utilitarian vessels collectibles? And 
Are the family in possession of any of these? How are they sort of acting within a market context? And where, when did that start? So one of the things that we've been um, really keen on as a curatorial team is to think about the range of ways that um, care can be exhibited for the objects in their provenance, for the um, African-American community in Edgefield, for the descendant families. What does care work look like in this regard? For much of the 20th century, and there are some exceptions, there's actually some really notable exceptions, but for much of the 20th century, this material was discarded and disregarded largely because of the hands that had made them, and it wasn't considered suitable for presentation in a kind of high art museum. And so, so much of the history has to do with um, disregard, at least from the vantage point of yeah, I don't like that term. I don't know who said it, but you're, yeah. Someone said fine art. It's a, it's a, I, don't, I don't like that term, but you know what I'm talking, you'll know what I'm talking about when I say that. There was a kind of disregard for this material from that vantage point. Now it depends on how you count um, to think about when it became, there, there are like these moments, there are these nodes of importance where it became increasingly um, um, popular and traded on um, a competitive art market. That's a part of what's happening here um, now. And we've been very clear, understanding full well that we are not necessarily the people who are supposed to have the answer to that question as, a, as the curatorial team. We've been trying to um, facilitate conversations, put people in rooms together to like think through that, to, to, to have thought leaders, community members, descendant communities, to have the folk who need to be at the table, we've tried as much as we can to kind of think through those, those care relationships. And that, again, is part of, the, part of what I think is gonna continue as, as the show officially closes, but the relationship do doesn't end. We have time for like one more question. Um. I'm super nervous. I talk all the time, but then when I have to talk, it makes me, it's, okay. I have a question. Um, I asked this question because I deal with it to myself when it comes to research as a black person from the South and currently living in the South. Um, so I wanna preface this by saying, this is an amazing body of work and I know that you're a curator. But, so for instance, for a little bit of so I can bring it all together because I'm nervous and words are everywhere. Um, I was able to visit the Clotilda in yeah. Mobile recently, yes. and it was amazing for research purposes and all of these other things. Um, and usually when I'm visiting these sites or just diving into research, I have these feelings of revival and connection. Like finally I'm there, I'm, I'm learning these things. Um, I'm feeling connected. And then I also have these feelings of displacement. So a lot of times I wonder, is this my place, A, to create these bodies of work, however they may come, um, to tell these stories and then to share them, or should I keep them to myself? So my question is, because I am a black-bodied person in the South doing these things. So my question is, with your experience that you just had as a black person first and a curator second, do you feel have those feelings of, okay, I'm done, I created the body of work, let's move on, That's, it is what it is. How, do you, how are you able, or do you feel any conflicting feelings of being in a space like this beautiful photograph right here with so much depth and pain, displacement and revival at the same time? Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And in the, um, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to sell a book right now, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, I'm not, I'm not trying to sell a book. But in the catalog, in the catalog for the show, I have in, in, uh, I write in the catalog, and I say in black and white print that I am uneasy about what it means to put these um, objects up for display in museum, in museum spaces. I am myself uncomfortable with it. And part of my own relationship with um, this material is like working, it's not even working through, it's working with. 
that discomfort. I have never gotten to a point where, oh, I feel fine now. I've resolved all the tensions now. I've, n I've never gotten to that point, and I don't think I ever will get to that point. Um, I am in the discomfort. You said a black-bodied person. I'm in the discomfort as a black-bodied person. I'm not trying to run away from it. I'm not trying to excuse it. I'm not trying to, like, um, over what had really happened. I'm not trying to do any of that. But I'm in it, really honestly in it, that discomfort. And I don't know that I'll ever be settled about that. Just one final, final question. Sorry. <laughs> no, the, <clears throat> excuse me. This is not a question. This is about the genealogists that found Dave's family. And I promised April, wherever we would go, I would always mention her name, how she connected Dave's family and found us, and that she will always remain in our hearts. We are so grateful that she, one day, she called, and I said, I will explain it. I don't care where I go. April, the genealogist that found Dave's family, she called, and she said, I've been looking so long for you. She said, are you Daisy? And I said, yes, I'm Daisy. She said, well, she went on about Brister Jones. She went on about Ella Jones. And she went on about the different family members. And I said, wait a minute. You know so much about my family. I want to know now who are you. <laughs> and she said to me, she said, you know, I know a whole lot about your family. And she said, I've been going so long trying to find you, to find you all. And she said, I found this beautiful obituary with this lady with this beautiful hat. And I called the Carolina family, which was an unusual name, which was the young man, the 16-year-old that wrote that. And she called his house. And <coughs> Alan's wife said, no, call Aunt Daisy. Aunt Daisy knows everything. And she did. And she put a lot of work into it, and she connected Dave's family. And I want the world to know we will always, always appreciate April Hines. And we are so grateful to her and her family. And our prayers are still going up for April. Thank you so much. April. Thank you again, Dr. Young, for just an absolutely incredible evening. Um, and thank you all for your, for your amazing questions. That was, it was really wonderful to hear from all of you. And thank you to Dave's family for being with us tonight. So I hope everyone will come back and see the show, keep experiencing it, keep living with it, learning from it. And, um, and we're just so uh, happy that, that you all came out tonight. So thank you.